Are you certain that Azjal Nerub can provide this many arachnithids, Krivax? Asked Dark Mage Rune Weaver, his voice echoing slightly from the other side of the scrying crystal. After a bit of evaluation, Dalaran eventually decided that the arachnithids would likely be the most useful variant of beast to throw against the horde. This was for a variety of reasons, including their production rate, general size and strength, and also their ability to dig shallow burrows for ambushes. There was also the fact that Dalaran's mages generally found it easier to control a single arachnithid rather than a swarm of skitterers. It should not be a problem, and Siren, this is easily within the kingdom's production capacity, Krivax said confidently. The two of them had been in consistent communication ever since Azjal Nabub and Dalaran had reached an agreement for the sale of beasts for the war. At some point, the Archmage had insisted that they drop the formalities and call each other by their first names, something Krivax was glad for. As it is, the only problem is the Jawmonger. The artifacts you offered to purchase them are sufficient, but High King is not willing to approve the deal until you've shown that the Alliance is capable of properly controlling them. The last thing that Azjal Nerub needed from a diplomatic perspective was for one of their giant worms to go rampaging through a city just because the people they sold it to were unable to control it. Krivax knew that if something like that happened, the aristocrats of the Eastern Kingdoms wouldn't hesitate to lay the blame at Azjal Nerub's feet to save their own skin. Archmage Runeweaver frowned before speaking with a tone that was clearly frustrated, Unfortunately, there are very few people here who use life magic. We have made attempts to recruit from the Thorn Speakers, and we've even sent an Arcanist to speak to the Witches of Gilnius, but our efforts have not had as much success as we hoped. What seems to be the problem? Krivax asked curiously. He knew very little about either the Thorn Speakers or the Witches as they were both rather obscure parts of Warcraft lore. At least Krivax believed they were. He had stopped paying attention to Warcraft some time before Kultiras was an available zone in the game, so it was possible that was why he had never heard of the Thorn Speakers. Well, to tell the truth, neither of those groups has a close relationship with their respective kingdoms, said Runeweaver. The Thorn Speakers generally keep to themselves, but there are many superstitious legends about them in Kultiran society. Runeweaver paused hesitantly before he continued speaking. Kultiras is a land of strange magics. The locals have rightfully learned to be cautious of things they do not understand. Krivax took a moment to absorb the Archmage's words. It made him feel worried whenever he heard about something that wasn't included in his meta-knowledge, such as the strange magics of Kultiras. But that was something that he was just going to have to get used to. He had already completely thrown the cannon plot off the rails, so he needed to learn how to roll with the punches. What about the witches? Krivax asked after a moment of silence. That story is a regretful one, said Rune Weaver, his tone filled with melancholy. Although the witches of old once used their magic to increase the agrarian yields of their local villages, they were driven nearly to extinction by the persecution of peasants with the rise of organized religion such as the Church of Holy Light, and the arcane magics introduced by the High Elves. Old traditions were quickly supplanted, trading it for fear and misunderstanding as few people dabbled in it. It came to a boiling point a few centuries ago, there was a panic that spread through the eastern kingdoms after a coven of witches in Drustvar, a region in Kultiras, destroyed a village for some kind of ritual. Nowadays you are very unlikely to see any witches outside of Gilnius. Krivax could easily imagine the consequences of an event like that. I see. Then how does Dalaran intend to resolve this issue? Asked Krivax. If you wish to control the Jawmonger then you will need someone capable of using nature magic in addition to one of our controlling artifacts. We haven't had much luck in Gilnius, but we have found a few nature mages in Kulturas who are willing to come out of isolation and help, said Runeweaver before letting out an amused chuckle. Although I would advise against calling them that to their face. They prefer to be referred to as either thorn speakers or practitioners of the old ways. Krivax thought about them as druids in his head, but he wouldn't have any problem calling them whatever they wanted. Azeroth was in for some difficult times in the future, and having these kinds of fringe organizations grow more involved in their societies could only be a good thing. Krivax discussed the logistical details of the deal with Ansirum for nearly an hour before they both began sharing information. Ansirum, I've recently heard rumors from our enclave in Dalaran that Archmage Crossus hasn't been seen in the city for several weeks. Has something happened? asked Krivax. It was difficult to know for certain if his anonymous letter had done its job, 
so he was hoping he could get some information out of Archmage Runeweaver. Everything is fine. Archmage Crossus has simply left Dalaran to take care of a few personal matters. When are you expecting him to return? asked Krivax, hoping that Crossus hadn't managed to get himself captured and that the Council of Six was simply covering up his disappearance it would not be a good sign if one of Dalaran's leaders appeared to up and vanish from the city not long before the Horde invaded. According to the message he sent just yesterday, the Archmage will return to the city in just a few weeks. Krivax let out a sigh of relief now that he had probable confirmation that Crossus wasn't currently chained up in Grim Batol. There was some chance that the messages were faked by Deathwing, but the Mad Dragon would likely prefer to sow panic by making it seem like the Archmage just disappeared into the night. Have the Knights of the Silver Hand truly completed their training so quickly? This seems a bit... rushed, and Syrah masked dubiously. Not long after the formation of the Alliance, a few days at most, Archbishop Fael and Supreme Commander Lothar announced that the Church of the Holy Light would be creating a new branch of the Church, an order of warriors trained in wielding the light. The Archbishop had then quickly started training the first members of the so-called Knights of the Silver Hand, Turalian, Uther, Tyrion Fordring, Sadan Dathrothan, and Gavin Red the Dyer. Krivax knew that these five men would become the first paladins of Azeroth, and legends in their own rights, but Archmage Runeweaver did not know that. Yes, they have. I would not worry too much about it, and Siren, said Krivax. According to Anuba Khan, they are all highly skilled warriors who are more than prepared for the war. I'm glad to hear that, said Runeweaver, sounding relieved. Although if Admiral Proudemore's boasts are to be believed, there may be hope that their skills might not be required. Proudemore had not been shy about declaring that the Horde would never be able to defeat the Alliance's navy and set foot on the northern portion of the continent. Their only other option was to try and cross the bridge connecting the northern and southern portions of the continent, Thandor Span. Given the efforts that Stromgard had put in to fortify said bridge, attempting to cross it would be suicide. Although many believed the Admiral's claims, Krivax wasn't sure how to feel about his odds. In canon, he'd primarily failed to hold back the Horde's navy due to their enslaved dragons, but that was likely no longer a factor. That wouldn't stop the initial battle, however, as the Horde had relied on their superior numbers to land enough troops in Hillsprad foothills. But on the other hand, Krivax was certain that Deathwing would make efforts to make up for their loss, though how he intended to do that was uncertain. If he wasn't able to find a replacement, Krivax could easily imagine Deathwing taking the field himself. If that happened, then the Alliance fleet wouldn't last long before being burnt to ash. Although, if he did that then he would probably end up facing the combined power of the other aspects as well as every Archmage in the Eastern Kingdoms. Not even Deathwing was confident enough to go up against such odds alone. The two of them speculated some more about the Horde's chances against the Alliance Navy before moving on to other topics. One of them included as Jean Nerub's decision to send a few of their elite soldiers to capture some of the Horde's Death Knights for study. After Anubakan heard the news, he insisted on accompanying them on their mission and left Capital City to meet the elite soldiers in Dalaran. Masruk had wanted to join as well, but he was still too young to be considered an elite soldier, to his extreme disappointment. After they finished discussing that, and Siren brought up a topic that was recently giving Krivax a bit of a headache, I've heard that there have been some tensions in Capital City between your delegation and the nobles. Yeah, that. Relations between the Nerubians and the nobles had been steadily improving until it felt like things took a turn for the worse about a week ago. The strangest thing about it was that Krivax couldn't pinpoint a single source or reason that was the cause of the tension. It felt like overnight nobles, who were previously either supportive or ambivalent to their presence, now looked at them with suspicion or spread rumors of them having malign intentions. It had gotten so bad that their deal with Alteruk was being delayed because Count Dalton's son had suddenly gone to his father and declared his opposition to the deal. As Jean Nerub's leadership believed that the shift was a result of one of the human kingdoms spreading rumors, but Privax knew that there was likely a different explanation. It hadn't taken very long before Hadix somehow reached the conclusion that the Void was increasing its presence in Capital City and had run off to investigate. The Vizier was not happy when he discovered that someone was using the Void to turn people against Azjol Nerub. Unfortunately, even if Deathwing was using his Void magic to sow distrust toward Nerubians in the minds of the aristocracy, 
There wasn't much he could do about it given couldn't remember the name of Deathwing's human form. Krivax was keeping his many eyes peeled for a suspicious human noble that was running around and causing problems, but he hadn't had any luck yet. Still, doesn't he have better things to do? It's not like a few rumors and a couple of distrustful nobles are going to tear apart the alliance. What is his plan? It made him feel worried to know that Deathwing was probably sneaking around the city, and a part of him worried that the changes he had made would end up being for the worse. The only thing that Krivax could do was hope that this was a temporary problem. Deathwing would need to leave eventually to assist the Horde and it would likely become difficult for him to stay in Capital City in the long term. If everything had gone to plan, then Crossus and Alex Straza were likely rallying the other aspects in their flights to confront Deathwing. He wouldn't be able to stay here once the city was secretly crawling with dragons. He's probably just here to gather information or something, and the spiteful bastard decided to take a potshot at us while he's here, Krivax thought hopefully. It was the only thing that made sense to him given the information he had available to him. There have been some tensions, yes, but I don't believe it's anything to worry about, Krivax said with more confidence than he felt. The Archmage hummed doubtfully but didn't comment any further on the matter. After that, there was not much left for them to discuss and they both said their farewells before ending their meeting. Krivax was sure that he would be speaking to the Archmage again soon given that he was the one handling most of the day-to-day -day diplomacy for the delegation. And now that the war was escalating and as Jean Nerub had begun supplying the alliance with Arachnathids and other war beasts, there was a lot for the delegation to do. Krivax put away the scrying crystal and turned his attention back to the numerous diplomatic letters that he needed to sort through. As he began his work, Krivax couldn't help but wish that he could do more than he currently was. Unfortunately, there was no easy way for him to drastically increase his strength in a short amount, and his meta-knowledge grew less useful every day as Azeroth's history shifted further from what he remembered. Sure, there was still a lot that he could do and more information that he could share but Krivax couldn't think of much he could do in the immediate future. For now, he would just have to wait to see where the chips landed after he sent his letter to Crossus. The first signs of change would be obvious once it came time for the Horde and the Alliance to have their fateful, first naval battle. Krivax didn't know specifically when it would happen, but all signs pointed to it happening soon. Eventually, he was certain that he would see an opportunity for him to be more proactive. In the meantime, I'll just continue studying my magic while doing my best to become a good diplomat. If I manage to do a good enough job, the leadership might trust me enough so that I'm not being babysat by Hadix or a new Bukhan. As Jean Nerub wasn't exactly overflowing with capable diplomats, so there was a chance Krivax could accumulate a decent amount of political power in his current position. As he was musing on his current situation and plans for the future, Krivax suddenly paused as his attention was grabbed by the contents of a particular letter, one that he had received from Stormwind. Hmm. This holds promise. Situated next to a bay in the wetlands north of Karsmoden was a large horde encampment filled with orcs and ogres eager for battle. Ships could be seen being docked in the bay, primarily captained by goblins, while several others were currently under construction. Inside a large tent in the center of this encampment, Orgrim Doomhammer growled in anger as he listened to the goblin share his latest reports of the Horde's naval might, and how it compared to the Alliance. Not only did the Horde not have much experience with constructing ships, sailing, and fighting at sea, but they were newcomers to this world, who simply had not had enough time to construct a naval fleet. As a result, Orgrim had been forced to use the wealth they had plundered from Stormwind to purchase shipbuilding services, maps, information, and mercenaries from the tiny green creatures that called themselves goblins. Listen, Mr. Warchief, things really aren't looking all that good for you right now, said the annoying little creature, a goblin by the name of Jitsik Smugabit, a representative of the Steamweedle cartel. Things were looking better when you were promising dragons that could burn up the human ships, but without that, your ships are going to get sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Sure, you'll be able to get past the Alliance at first, on account of there being so many of you, but that's not going to fix your long-term problems, understand? As it is, you're going to need to put out a lot of gold to hire captains willing to send themselves and their ships into an obvious suicide job, big guy. Although he had instructed some of his men to learn how to construct ships and sail, Orgrim knew something like that would take years to accomplish. Therefore most of their fleet currently came from Steamweedle mercenary captains and their ships. 
Orgrim held back the urge to smash the little creature's head with his hammer as it told him things he didn't want to hear. The Horde had enough enemies, and from what he could tell, the Steamweedle Cartel was not a group he wished to casually antagonize. Is your cartel truly incapable of providing the ships we need to overcome the humans? Orgrim asked impatiently. We still have more than enough gold from our conquering of Stormwind, and there will be plenty more after we destroy the rest of the human kingdoms. Look, buddy. I love gold as much as any self-respecting goblin, but I also love living to enjoy that gold more, said Jitsik, his tone irreverent as he explained the situation to Orgrim. Trade Prince Steamwielder is willing to provide you guys with anything you need to win this war, but nothing we give is going to let you win against a navy as powerful as the one you're up against. It was a different story before, but it's looking like you're out of luck, Mr. Warchief. Orgrim let out a stream of curses the second that the goblin left. Damn that fool, Zulud. I should have never trusted that he would be able to keep his worthless promises. When Zulu the Wacked had come to him with tales that he had received visions of a powerful artifact that could be turned against the humans and requested permission to go find it, Orgrim had allowed him to do so. Zulud was a chieftain and Orgrim had believed that the man had the best interests of the Horde in mind. Also, there was a part of him that hoped that Zulud's visions were a sign that the elements were forgiving his people for turning away from them in favor of Gul'dan's evil magic. Ever since their old world, Draenor, had been ruined by the warlocks, none of their shamans had received a single vision. Those hopes grew after Zulud returned with an artifact of such strength that raw unfettered power practically emanated from it in waves. Zulu promised to use the artifact, which he called the Demon Soul, to enslave the flying fire-breathing lizards of this world to use against the humans, and Orgrim had centered all of his plans around this promise. However, instead of dragons, the only thing coming from Grimbatol were hideous mutated dwarves that had suddenly risen from beneath the fortress. The only reason they hadn't needlessly lost orc lives was because that freakish ogre Chigal managed to control the creatures like he controlled the Twilight's Hammer Clan. Now, Promises had been left unfulfilled and Orgrim was left looking like a fool as the Horde had no way to defeat the human navy. Orgrim stewed in his anger for several minutes before he was interrupted by a grunt entering his tent and giving an orcish salute, tapping his fist twice against his chest. Warchief, Chigal of the Twilight's Hammer Clan has requested an audience. Think of the monster, and he will come. Orgrim didn't like Chigal, the ogre was as insane as the clan that he led and several times as dangerous. Although the members of the Twilight's Hammer were pitiful creatures twisted by dark and dangerous magic that Orgrim did not understand, very few of them could be considered an actual threat. Chigal on the other hand was a powerful two-headed ogre, a creature of both great physical and magical strength that was significantly more intelligent than his single-headed kin. But Orgrim couldn't exactly afford to ignore him. The Horde needed the strength of the Twilight's Hammer especially now that the ogre had increased the number of monsters under his command. Let him in. The grunt quickly nodded before retreating in the direction that he came. A few moments later, the massive form of Chigal was making its way into the tent. Like the rest of his kin, the ogre wore little other than a loincloth and a little armor over his stomach. Speak, Chigal, Orgrim said impatiently. He didn't want to waste any more time speaking to the ogre than necessary. Warchief. I have heard that the Horde is having difficulty finding a way to overcome the human ships, said Chagall, his more intelligent head speaking while his other, single-eyed head hummed and made strange noises. I have come to offer you my services. I see you're following in your master's footsteps, Ogre, Orgrim said derisively. Just like Gul'dan, you come to me with promises of using your foul magics to solve all of my problems. Before the more intelligent head could respond, the stupid one decided to speak first. Gul'dan is not my master. No, no. My master is the old ones. Dark ones. Whispers in the nights. Humph. Pathetic fool. Are you dissatisfied with the death knights provided by Gul'dan, Warchief? Do you have a reason to doubt my promises? Orgrim almost wished that he could say yes, so he could have an excuse to slaughter Gul'dan, Chigal, and the last few remaining members of the Shadow Council. He would never forget the role they played in ruining his people, nor would he forgive. But for now, he needed them. Orgrim swallowed his anger before responding to the ogre, Go on then, Chigal. Tell me what new monstrosities you wish to give me. My plan is quite simple, Warchief. You were correct to believe that we need dragons to defeat the human ships. 
Given that Zulud has failed to capture live ones that we can use, I propose we simply raise their corpses into undeath as we do for our death knights. Orgrim paused as he considered the ogre's words. Undead dragons would certainly solve most of his problems, but the problems with that were obvious. Where do you expect me to find dragon corpses, you fool? If finding them were so easy, then I would have already thought of this myself. Shouted Orgrim, angry that the ogre was wasting his time. There is one dragon corpse waiting where Zulu left it, but I understand your concerns. Fortunately, my gods know where to find these corpses, war chief. Allow me to prove it to you, said Chagall, his expression twisting into an insane smile before he reached into the bag strapped to his side and pulled out a strange book. Orgrim took a moment to study the book before his expression turned into one of anger and revulsion. This is a book that I created myself, war chief. I call it the Twilight Canticle said Chagall, both of his heads showing a sick amount of pride as he displayed a book made of flesh. And where did you get the flesh to make that foul book, Ogre? asked Torgrim, his voice filled with disgust. From the pale. They were more than eager to donate their flesh for the cause, Chagall said calmly as if his life was not currently in danger. Orgrim paused and took a closer look at the so-called Twilight Canticle, realizing that the skin was a paler color than that of a typical orc. It matched what he would expect from a member of the Twilight's Hammer Clan, who were typically paler than a normal orc, leading to most members of the Horde to refer to them as the Pale. Why are you showing me this? I have no interest in your hobbies or those of your insane followers. The Twilight Canticle is the culmination of my efforts to attune myself to the gods of this world, and through it, they share with me their wisdom, Chigal explained patiently. The ogre turned the book to its last page. It is through this that reveals to me the way forward, and shows me the location of dead dragons. As Orgrim examined the last page of the disgusting book, a crude but still usable map, he felt a distinct suspicion that someone or something was using his hoard for its own ends. He had already started to grow slightly suspicious after hearing about Zulu's visions, although part of him wished to believe their source was pure, but now he was nearly certain that he was being manipulated. This was the second time that one of his people had come to him with a way to overcome the humans with knowledge gifted to them from an unverifiable source. He would be a fool not to see what was happening, it was so obvious that Orgrim wondered why the source of this information even bothered hiding. It was times like this that made him seriously consider finishing his purge of the dishonor and darkness that infested Horde. He was beginning to believe that his half-measures were more trouble than they were worth and he should solely rely on the strength of the Horde itself and nothing else to see them to victory. But he still needed their strength. For now. The second they took Capital City though, he would certainly revisit the thought. How many dragons can we reanimate? Asked Torgrim with a sense of resignation. Despite how suspicious this all was, he knew that he had few options. The Death Knights are reanimated using the souls of dead warlocks. How many of those do we have left? None, Warchief, we have used them all to create what death knights we already have, said Chagall, his voice losing some of its insanity now that he was talking about logistics instead of his vile book. Any dragons that we reanimate will lack consciousness, and their movements will be sloppy and slow in comparison to their living counterparts. They will need to be actively guided if they are to be of any use. Orgrim grunted thoughtfully as he considered what he had heard. Even with such limitations, these undead dragons would still be a force to be reckoned with and would be able to remain out of reach for most of the human forces. It would take the entire focus and most of the power of a single death knight to raise and maintain control of one undead dragon, therefore we are limited only by their own number, Chigal continued to explain. Of course, this also means that they will not be able to use their abilities to raise undead to fight alongside your warriors. Orgrim didn't miss the fact that this would mean the undead dragons would be under the control of the Death Knights themselves. Although they claimed to be loyal to the Horde above all else, Orgrim could never forget that they were the creations of Gul'dan and former warlocks of the Shadow Council, those he personally killed even. He would have to take measures to defend the Horde should they turn against him. How many of these dragons can we have ready by the time we need to set sail? Orgrim asked seriously. His horde could not afford to wait long before they began running out of food and supplies. Not to mention that if they waited too long the humans would be prepared for their arrival and make any invasion a much riskier endeavor. Controlling such powerful undead beasts is well beyond what the Death Knights have had to do so far. It will require training to learn how to do so effectively, said Chigal. The most skilled, 
such as Taryn Gore Fiend, will likely be able to learn quickly. The rest will learn over the course of the invasion. We can likely have two or three prepared in the time you have given. Two or three. That much would have likely been enough if the dragons were alive, but if they were as slow and sloppy as Chigal claimed, then there was a high risk they would be torn apart by cannon fire. Just as Orgrim was about to ask if there was anything that could be done to speed up the Death Knight's training, the ogre interrupted him. Of course, I understand that two or three dragons may not be enough. However, my masters offer other gifts as well, said Chigal, turning to a different page in his book. As Orgrim read through the page's contents, a small part of him couldn't help but be glad that these dark forces were currently working in his favor. For now at least. If the contents of this book were accurate, then the Alliance had no idea about the dangers hiding in their midst. It is a pleasure to have you here, Lady Windrunner, Lothar greeted the elf in front of him with a smile and a polite handshake. Call me Illyria. Lady Windrunner is my mother, the dubbed Illyria said with a smile. Thank you for having me and those who Quelthalas was helpful enough to let aid you. Lothar didn't miss the grimace on the face of the otherwise beautiful elf and couldn't deny feeling the same way. It was not a secret that despite the impassioned calls of aid made by King Menethil and himself requesting that the High Elves honor their ancient debt to the Arathi bloodline, that Quelthalas was still reluctant at best to send any aid to assist the alliance of Lordaeron against the Horde. They were so sure of their own safety that they saw no point in sending anyone to fight, and the fact that Lothar got Illyria and her followers at all was nothing short of a miracle of the light itself. And not much of one in the end. Is there truly no chance that Quelthalas will send more aid? Turalyon, who was nearby at the command table with them, asked. I'll be honest. The only reason why we are here at all is because King Sunstrider wishes to wipe away a debt to the Arathi bloodline through your supreme commander for as little of a cost as possible. The idea of owing a human anything is a stain on his and most elves' pride, Illyria said with a sneer and pain in her eyes. Lothar could tell that she likely had personal reasons for feeling so strongly on the matter. Not all of us feel the same way, however, so I volunteered myself and gathered those that agreed with me that the Horde is a threat we shouldn't let spiral out of control. If I hadn't, you would have received even less than what I came here with. Fewer than a few hundred elf rangers and a handful of destroyers. Lothar didn't want to imagine less than that. He could only sigh and nod. We will make do and thank you again for coming in our time of need. I promise we will make up for what we lack in numbers through our superior skill, Illyria promised him. Let us pray it is enough, for the Horde certainly has the numbers that such skill will be needed, Lothar said before turning to Turalyon. Go with fast rider Illyria to help integrate her forces among the defenses. Yes, Supreme Commander, his lieutenant was quick to follow his order guiding Illyria out from the command tent and quickly striking up a conversation. He hoped they got along well, this conflict needed as little internal infighting as possible after all. It was a problem that he faced every day as the Alliance was still struggling with building up defenses and gathering their combined forces here in Hillsprad foothills. How are the preparations Uther? Lothar returned to speak with his other lieutenant at the command table after receiving several reports from a courier. Slow was Uther's disappointed but unsurprised reply. The man had been working ceaselessly alongside him and Turalyon to make their preparations go as swiftly as possible, but there was a limit to how quickly such matters could go. Damnation, Lothar sighed as he placed both his hands on the table and glared at the map before him. Lord Aron's military is moving the fastest, but much of their forces are focused on fortifying the roads to capital city as best they are able. The other kingdoms are mostly doing the same, and are therefore slow to send most of their soldiers here to prepare for the Horde's arrival. They believe that your prediction that the Horde will strike at Lordaeron's capital first to be overconfident. Lordaeron is the largest and most powerful human kingdom here in the north, Lothar repeated out loud for what felt like the hundredth time. The orcs always seek out the largest threat and strike at it with all their might. That is why I'm sure they will come this way. The alliance is new and many parties still don't fully trust each other, there was always going to be resistance, Uther pointed out. I suppose I hope that their sense of self-preservation would overpower their pride and paranoia, Lothar grumbled. It's also possible that they are simply that confident in Lord Proudmoore's abilities, Uther reminded him. The Horde's fleet was last measured to be several hundred ships at least. 
There is no telling how many there will be once they actually set sail, Lothar reminded him of the same intelligence report they have all read. Even if Admiral Proudmoore sinks half the fleet that still means there will be near uncountable amounts of enemy forces reaching our shore that we must prepare for. And if he does not, then we will meet them the moment they set foot on our lands, the light is on our side, Uther said with confidence and glowed a bit as well at the declaration. Ever since he and the others, the newly formed paladins of the Knights of the Silver Hand, had completed their training with the Archbishop, each one of them had been filled with a sense of certainty that made Lothar envious. To be so certain of something and work hard to make it a reality. But Lothar had once been confident in his ability to defend Stormwind. Yet his confidence had proven to be unwarranted and he had failed to protect those he was charged to defend. Still, the last thing soldiers needed to hear was their leader feeling doubt. Of course, but the light won't do everything for us, Lothar countered. Ha! Huh. That it won't, Uther agreed with a smile. Did I miss a joke? spoke up a familiar voice as it entered the command tent. Lothar quickly turned and smiled to see his friend, Kedga, recently returned from his trip to Dalaran via his ability to teleport. A most convenient magical ability. The mage looked more like Lothar's age than the young man he truly was. His premature aging was a result of their battle with Medivh, the mage's insane former master and the man responsible for opening the dark portal. Thankfully, he acted much more like his genuine age than the age he appeared. He certainly dressed no differently with his purple robes and staff, which made sense since he was a member of the Kirin Tor and the Alliance's direct connection to Dalaran at this time. Yes, unless you've brought good news, Lothar answered. In that case I suppose I must miss out on the fun, Kadgar answered, sounding quite smug. Truly? What further aid could Dalaran give that they are not already providing? Lothar asked curiously. Dalaran, next to Lordaeron, was the most active in supporting the alliance but had a very small standing army compared to the larger kingdoms and could not send many bodies. The fact that most of those bodies did much to make up for it, but few were truly combat capable and their leaders had to stay behind to guard Dalaran itself. Apparently they completed a trade deal with Azjol Nerub, Kadga began to explain. One that will help offset our numerical disadvantage against the Horde to a certain degree. Lothar did not know much about the Nerebians of Azjol Nerub personally, the only thing he had to compare them with were the peaceful giant spiders of the Brightwood back home, his attention totally upon what could be done to combat the Horde alone. Like the Elves, the Nerebians made it clear they had no desire to take part in the conflict against the Horde. Unlike them, Lothar could at least understand the logistic nightmare it would be to even try to transport their armies from Northrend to here even if they did. How so? Uther asked curiously. While the Nerebians as a whole are still not joining us against the Horde they have agreed to become our war suppliers, Kadga explained. We need bodies, not weapons, Lothar explained in turn, feeling slightly disappointed. The Alliance did not lack for steel. Which is exactly what they are providing, Kadka explained. For you see, the Nerebians make use of a number of war beasts is the best term I suppose. They breed and make use of a number of strong and vicious creatures, all controllable via arcane means not unlike how a mage controls an elemental or a golem. However, they can make their creatures much quicker and cheaper than either of those options. I have a list of them here. Kadga then handed Lothar a piece of parchment that he soon lay on the table. As he and Uther read it over they both couldn't help but raise their eyebrows a bit. This was both impressive and horrifying at the same time. Well, if nothing else we can use these beasts to help preserve the lives of our soldiers and ideally cause great damage against the Horde itself, Uther pointed out. These giant scorpion-like creatures of theirs alone could be of great use on the battlefield and striking from unexpected angles. Indeed. Lothar admitted. There is also another bit of potentially good news, Kadga spoke up once more. But I will leave that to the guest that I picked up and brought along from Dalaran. You may enter. At those words, the command tent opened up again, and Lothar and Uther watched as one of the gigantic Nerebian spider lords bent down and carefully walked through. Lothar had not forgotten how tall these Nerebians were, especially these spider lords who were utterly massive and had a terrifying appearance. Greetings, Supreme Commander Lothar, and Sir Uther, the Nerebian spoke respectfully. Honored to see you again, Anuba Khan, Uther answered back with familiarity in his voice. Lothar vaguely recalled Turalian and Uther, 
along with the other paladins, speaking of the Spider Lord that had joined them in their training. From what he had last heard, he was still doing so in an effort to steadily increase his understanding of the light. As am I, but I am here on business first and foremost. I am here on behalf of Azjol Nerub. In partnership with Dalaran and the Kirin Tor, Kadka spoke up. To offer the services of a small number of elite Nerubian warriors to aid you against the Horde, Anuba Khan finished. So long, of course, you allow them to complete their primary mission during the course of the war. Primary mission? Lothar asked with some suspicion. The High King is very interested and concerned about the Horde's Death Knights, and intends to offer aid so that Azjol Nerub and Dalaran might capture and study as many of them as possible, Anuba Khan explained. Lothar nodded, understanding the reasoning of wanting to learn more about those abominations and how to counter them. His best bet so far would be to send Uther and the other paladins against them, but they were few to their still few but greater foes. We intend to capture and transport them to the Violet Hold in Dalaran so that we might learn more about them and their magic, Anuba Khan explained. It goes without saying that the fewer the Horde have on the battlefield the fewer soldiers you will lose. On that, Lothar could only agree. If I am to allow this, it must be with the understanding that while they may carry out their mission when possible they are to follow my and mine's orders, follow the chain of command, and not do anything that endangers the Alliance's war effort in the process, Lothar made clear. Naturally, Anuba Khan quickly acquiesced. They understand that by taking part in this mission that they are going to war, that you are to be their leader until such time they are recalled, and that they are to follow you as they would follow a spider lord into battle. As Jean Nerub wishes to make it clear that our objectives align and that we are able to cooperate. They will make fine strike teams against vulnerable enemy locations. Lothar would be the judge of that, but he could not afford to say no to more support no matter where it came from or its objectives, especially when by all accounts it truly did align with them. Very well, Lothar agreed. I will need to meet these troops before anything else. As you say, Anuba Khan nodded. I am also here to assist in the transfer of war beasts to your control. If there is any other business that directly requires Nerubian contact, please inform me. I shall. Thank you for your aid, Lothar said sincerely. You are welcome, human. And let us hope that more of it is not required, the Spider Lord said as he turned and left, leaving the three men alone to discuss among themselves. Can we trust them? Lothar asked Uther and Kadgar honestly. They are more straightforward than the elves at least, Uther noted. I've even befriended Anuba Khan and another warrior of theirs, and both seem to be stand-up men. Anuba Khan alone has the drive to learn as much of the light as possible that could challenge some bishops, and the archbishop himself considers him a friend.